A very warm welcome to all of you, whether you're in the room or watching via live stream. From Harvey Weinstein to Les Moonves, from the Boston Globe Spotlight investigation to the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report on Sex Abuse in the Roman Catholic Church, from Lawrence G. Nassar to the list of hundreds in the Olympic Committee's U.S. Center for Safe Sport, from the 2015 Association of American, the Association of American Universities Campus Survey on Sexual Assault, to the biennial reports of the Title IX Office at Yale University, and from Clarence Thomas to Brett Kavanaugh, accounts of sexual misconduct have made violence against women and children one of our most pressing moral issues. Yale Divinity School has made a commitment to address critical issues through panels of experts from Yale and the local community in different parts of the country. As a Divinity School, we do so because we believe that religion has a role to play in addressing major societal issues that are not only legal issues, but moral issues. We believe that all human beings should be treated with respect, regardless of their gender, their sexual orientation, or identity. The Me Too movement has empowered many survivors to speak out who have been treated, who have not been treated as full human beings, but as pawns who could be controlled through the abuse of power. The change in the climate is evident not only from media reports, but from the number of cases of sexual misconduct reported at Yale. The Title IX office in the provost office issues reports about sexual abuse every six months. Prior to the second half of 2015, this is when the AAU report was issued, the average number of complaints was 58 for each six month period. Since then, it has risen to 101. And the most recent report contained 154. It is progress to realize that silence is not golden. But the shattering of silence is not enough. There must be transformation. And if I may speak candidly, this transformation needs to include men. The majority of offenders are men. At Yale, 86% of the complaints are against men and only 3% against women. 11% are undetermined or the percentage against men would probably rise. Why? We've lived with patriarchy for so long that the intoxication of power has led far too many to feel that they have the prerogative to abuse human beings. The status quo must change. We have made more progress legally than we have made culturally, psychologically, and morally. These transformations will not be done in one night, but we can foster them. I am very grateful to the five individuals, our moderator and all four panelists, who have agreed to help us think through the complexities of the issues that confront us. These are sensitive and potentially explosive. Thank you for your time and for your courage to speak. Our moderator is Galen Sherwin, the senior staff attorney at the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU. Ms. Sherwin is a 1994 alumna of Yale College. After graduation, she worked as a legislative aide for a New York senator and subsequently as a president of the New York chapter of NOW. That led her to go back to law school. She attended Columbia Law School from which she graduated in 2003. And after a clerkship and a period as a Blackman Fellow in the Center for Reproductive Rights, she joined the New York Civil Liberties Union as a staff attorney, first in the Reproductive Rights Project and then in the Women's Rights Project in 2009, 
where she is still employed and has ascended through the scale until she's uh, reached the level she now enjoys. We are delighted and honored that she will serve as our moderator. Would you please join me in welcoming our moderator? Thank you so much for inviting me and for that warm introduction and welcome. Um, so I'm just going to start by giving a tiny bit of context before introducing the panelists and then sort of throwing some questions to them. And then we will leave some questions, some time for questions and answers from uh, the audience at the end. Um, so in, in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal, Me Too sprung up and launched a public conversation about gender-based violence and harassment, predominantly, though not exclusively, of women by men. Although the hashtag gained prominence when the actress Alyssa Milano encouraged others to tweet out their stories of harassment or assault, the phrase was actually coined by Bronx activist Toronto Burke, who as early as 2006 made it a focus of her organization Just Be, helping victims of sexual harassment and assault, primarily girls of color. The Me Too movement did not arise out of nowhere. It has built upon the hard and in many cases unrecognized work of numerous feminist advocates like Tarana Burke who made eliminating gender-based violence their life's work. It built upon the bravery of individuals like Anita Hill or Ann Vinson who spoke their truth and scholars like Catherine McKinnon who helped give us words to describe it. And more recently, it's also taken place, of course, against the context of growing student activism nationwide around university campuses, obligations to respond effectively to allegations of gender-based violence and harassment on campus to campuses today. So our discussion today really could not be more timely in light of the allegations that have been mounting against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court Dr. Blasey Ford's allegations that Judge Kavanaugh attempted to rape her in high school, followed by allegations that he assaulted Deborah Ramirez when they were both undergraduates at Yale, has once again prompted a public reckoning with the seriousness with which we as a society take women's allegations of abuse and assault. For, day, for today's conversation, I want to acknowledge not that there might be survivors in the room, but that there are survivors of assault and abuse in the room. And for those survivors among us, the previous weeks, months, and yes, years since the presidential election have been tremendously painful, causing many of us to re-examine and relive past experiences of trauma. So I ask that in light of that, the conversation today take place in the most respectful manner possible and in general in your lives. I encourage each of us here today to be sensitive to the fact that our friends, loved ones, family members, coworkers, and others we interact with may themselves be survivors. So with that um, sort of rules of engagement, uh, I will um, introduce our amazing panel today and then we'll start with some questions and each of them will give a, an opening statement. So um, first off, I'd like to welcome Pastor Kaji Dosha, who is a senior pastor at the Park Avenue Christian Church and the first woman to serve in that role in the congregation's 206 years. In that role, she has publicly witnessed the need for the church to repent for the misuse of ch Christian teachings to oppress others, spoken out to spread a message of welcome and liberation, and lived out her church's call to be a force for racial, social, and economic justice. And if you haven't listened to her, we're, we're going to have a treat listening to her today, but if you haven't listened to her, any of her sermons, I encourage everyone to do so because they are truly moving um, and amazing. Yosef Soret is an associate professor in the Religion Department and the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University, where he, is also, he also directs the Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice. Yosef employs historical and literary approaches to the study of religion in black communities and cultures in the United States, and he's currently editing an anthology entitled The Sexual Politics of Black Churches. 
Um, oh, I skipped over you, Carmelin. Sorry about that. So, <laughs> Carmelin Malalas, commissioner, was appointed chair and commissioner of the New York City Commission on Human Rights by Mayor Dil Bill de Blasio in two November 2014, following more than a decade in private practice as an advocate for employees' rights in the workplace. Commissioner Malalas was previously a partner at Outen and Golden LLP, where she co-founded and co-chaired the firm's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender workplace practice group, and its disability and family responsibilities discrimination practice group, and she's also co-counseled with me on cases and was a colleague of mine in undergraduate. And finally, um, Reverend Dr. Serene Jones is the 16th president of the historic Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York and the first woman to head the 180-year-old institution. She is the immediate past president of the American Academy of Religion and was previously the Titus Street Professor of Theology at the Yale Divinity School and chair of the university's program in women, gender, and sexuality studies, which was my major. So um, this is such an incredible panel, and I'm so happy to be um, moderating it. So we'll start with just um, giving a brief open opening remarks, and then we'll move to some questions. Thank you so much, and what an honor it is to be here. Uh, because it's such a sensitive topic, I'm going to do something I wouldn't usually, which is to share stories by reading a few prepared words. I left DC after high school. We graduated in our white gowns holding bouquets of red roses in one hand and diplomas in the other, with ankles crossed just so, just as I'm doing now and hands folded just like this as we had been trained, we Holton Arms girls completed the finishing academy as the very symbols of purity, pride, and ambition. We were instructed in the art of how to find a way or make one, and immediately afterwards, I made my way out of DC. I left because I was tired of being physically assaulted and verbally harassed. It's in this context that I read the news about Dr. Chris C. Blasey Ford, also a graduate of this school who I never met. But her story felt very DC. For me, finding my way from daily sexual harassment meant leaving that place. And one of the places I came was to Yale. Not too long ago, Yale gathered some major donors and those who might inspire them. And just to be clear, I'm of the latter end of that. <laughs> for a two-day event. You're the only woman at this table someone noticed before I did. Lively conversation and wine flowed. Don't keep up with the guys, I thought. Lesson I learned hard. In the middle of arguing the ethics of voting, one older white man, probably in his late 60s, offered this observation to our table of 12. Actually, he began, which is an interesting word to preface Actually, I think you're quite beautiful. As he smiles at me, as if he's surprised, as if this attraction he's declaring is unexpected, he continues, I bet your congregation loves to watch you preach. I would too if I could look at you every week. No wonder they called you as their minister. Now, any woman who is accustomed to being the only woman at the table knows how to respond. Some of us have honed our responses for years. Many of us have way too much practice in this. And there are goals to be met, like number one, you can't get angry because it's too hard to come back from it. Folks who like to incite a response for the hell of it will look at you as an easy target and then blame you for being weak. Number two, your retort must be swift, vicious, <laughs> and hilarious. The problem has to be named so that it's clear that you suffer no fools. Being the only woman at the table means being ready with the quick rejoinder. Number three, you cannot let this get to you. You have to have skin of steel, impermeable. Your heart cannot break. You cannot lose confidence. In other words, in order to be the only woman at the table, you have to be magic. And every great magician I've seen admits to being an illusionist. Magic is a performance. It tricks the eye and deflects from the raw mechanics that make it happen. Being as performance and existence as illusion comes at a cost. And that day, I thought I had won. But the next day, off in the corner as I went to refresh 
my water from the jug filled with fruit slices. I took a sip and this pastor of a Methodist church came and rubbed my shoulder, glad to see me, he said. He continued throughout the day, escalating his ways of accessing my body until they got worse and worse. At a loss, I was reminded how my magic actually doesn't protect my body because magic never can. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, you know, I am, I want to say first thank you to Yale Divinity School for putting this together. Um, it, is, it is always interesting for me to be amongst div-related folks, clergy folks. Um, I do a lot of public speaking, but when you're around clergy, you know, forget about it. There's no, there is, there's no contest. Um, so it is, it is always great, though, to be around, uh, to be around folks from, from other areas who are looking at these types of issues. And I will also just note, incidentally, Serene Jones was my college senior thesis advisor. Um, so, and there was a point when I did consider Div school because of Serene Jones. But as luck would have it, I became a lawyer instead. Uh, so anyway, I am the chair and commissioner for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And for folks that may not know, we are the city agency that enforces New York City's very broad, and very protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections. Uh, and we have pretty broad jurisdiction. We do this in virtually every area of city living. Everywhere in New York City, you will eat, breathe, work, sleep. That is our jurisdiction. So in employment, in housing, uh, in places of public accommodation, on the street, if people experience any sort of discrimination or harassment, we have both civil law enforcement powers to address that. Uh, we affirmatively also litigate those issues. And we also have mandates to reach out to different communities that are experiencing different types of discrimination and harassment uh, and to make sure that they are aware of and they understand their rights under the law, their obligations under the law, and also how different communities in the city or different constituent groups in the city can be working together to truly create more, uh, not just diverse, but also very inclusive, truly inclusive environments. And you know, I was appointed in 2014. So in the past, I want to say almost four years that I've been at the agency, a lot of our focus has been on reaching out to communities that the city uh, generally hasn't had strong relationships with. Um, vulnerable communities that have not had strong relationships with government, either because of over-policing or uh, surveillance or because they have had difficult Time, difficult, uh, uh, difficulty accessing resources through government. And we are, are generally very interested in issues uh, where we know that because of the city's protections, we can make a big difference. Because of the, you know, 24 categories of protection that we have in New York City that most jurisdictions don't have. Because there is great will within New York City to be standing up for communities that generally are not, uh, do not have voices or do not have representation. Um, and like the other issues that we've looked at, you know, we, we have uh, stood up for transgender and gender nonconforming folks when we saw that there was you know, 22 anti-trans bills uh, introduced uh, in the nationwide. We stood up for trans individuals with campaigns and emphasis on legal enforcement within the city. We've stood up for Muslim uh, and uh, South Asian and Arab communities in the city when we've also seen increases in xenophobia and anti-Semitism and uh, Islamophobia. And in this last year, as we have seen uh, both the national rhetoric uh, as well as local rhetoric come out with um, the conversation around Me Too, it has been similarly very interesting for us. Uh, under the law, people generally think of sexual harassment with the federal standard. Uh, Galen mentioned one of the cases, but the, the, sexual, the, the, the law, the jurisprudence around sexual harassment on the federal standard basically developed out of a situation where a woman was raped in a bank vault. 
uh, and created the current standard we have right now under federal law. Basically, that the conduct has to be considered severe or pervasive. And here in New York City, being, again, a jurisdiction that has broad remedial protections, we have a different standard. Our standard for sexual harassment is if somebody is treated less well because of their gender. And what that means, or that there are situations that if you look at the federal standard, which has been adopted by several states and lo localities, um, there are situations that happen involving some of the things that we're hearing about uh, related to the Kavanaugh hearings that would not be considered sexual harassment in the workplace. And so New York City and our office has been called pretty frequently in the last year to, uh, to testify, to provide advice, or consult with other jurisdictions or elected officials that are considering trying to make some of those changes in their own states or nationally. It is, it is uh, for me, very clear, even as a lawyer, that though we have these protections in New York City and though law is one of the ways that people seek remedies for things such as sexual harassment or sexual assault, that the law is not going to be the answer, right? And I think that is essentially what the Me Too movement has been doing in the last, as its, its resurrection has come back up last year, I feel like that is essentially what has happened in Me Too. That there was a movement started by a woman of color in 2006, Tarana Burke, as Galen mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. And when she first started that, she started it basically to create a space of empathy and understanding for sexual assault survivors and victims um, particularly in communities of color. And the fact that it has had now such meaning, still, 12 years later, and through celebrity has been able to have this viral moment that has continued, so I actually will take the word back, it's actually not a, movement, a moment, it's a movement, I think is really telling of how we as communities our understanding, our changing, our developing, our embracing topics, not because the law says it's so, because this has now existed in the law for a long time, but we are having these conversations, you're having this panel, uh, because there are people in your communities, in your families, in everyday life that are at you know, great expense to themselves, taking it upon themselves to share their stories and to put themselves out there very vulnerably so that people can understand what they are going through, right? Um, there was just a rally in New York City on Monday, uh, and it was called New York City Stands Up Surv for Survivors, where there were several folks uh, who were there talking about their experiences of sexual assault, or, or folks who work with survivors of sexual assault who were there talking about the work that they're doing. And, you know, what struck me is that over and over again, people, again, were putting themselves out there and taking on this burden to sway public opinion, to literally, in, in, in the situation that we are living in right now, sway votes, right? And I've had this conversation with a lot of my uh, women of color friends where it felt very, it feels very similar to being in situations where we feel like, you know, why is it always that people of color have to educate on you know, why this is racist, why this is white supremacy. And here we are in this space with women taking, on, mostly women, but uh, people who are uh, men, women, non-binary folks, trans folks, taking it upon themselves to put themselves out there at great cost to themselves. So I'm grateful to be surrounded by folks who are not just looking at this through the lens of the law, but are really engaging with their students or congregants um, or their communities to have these conversations as well. Thank you, Carmeline. Uh, good evening. Uh, I want to echo uh, uh, Carmen, Carmeline and thanking uh, Dean Sterling and the Divinity School uh, for the invitation to participate. Uh, I will admit, um, maybe for obvious reasons, that it was both uh, an honor and a source of anxiety. Uh, <laughs> because, of course, I'm the only non-Yale alum on the panel. Uh, right. uh, bear with me. Um, um, 
But also, uh, uh, in earnest, want to echo something more substantive uh, that Carmelin uh, mentioned in her remarks, and that, uh, and, and begin with my opening remarks to take cues from one of the, 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 the uh, questions that might be directed to me as to what uh, role might men play. And I think uh, of this as, as corollary uh, to a question that I'm often asked in racial justice questions, uh, conversations is what can white people do, right? Um, and so what, what might, and I think you gestured in this direction um, in, in your comments as well. And um, to ask that, uh, I won't offer the answer, but, but one of the ways I was thinking about this question, and first is that is simply to hold other men accountable. Um, hold other men accountable, um, hold men in general accountable. And that begins, I think, first, uh, as has been echoed in recent weeks, listen, trust, believe uh, women and survivors when they speak, right? Learn, begin and learn uh, by listening to women. Um, and then second, um, do the work in holding men accountable by beginning with yourself. Uh, and checking and calling to attention the all sorts of unchecked biases, uh, both mundane and uh, more obvious that are, are part of our everyday experiences that normalize the inequalities and privilege that we take uh, as we enter the space uh, as men. So check oneself, uh, check other men um, at the level of uh, interpersonal relationships when your buddy uh, gestures in the direction of locker room banter uh, that we know is one of the spaces where gender-based violence gets normalized and taken for granted and becomes a silly joke. Speak up, say something. Check yourself when you start to say it because it's become so ritualized in the habits in which we're socialized as men, as this is just normal behavior at the level of the self, at the level of interpersonal relationships, and then uh, obviously uh, at the level of institutional involvement. Use the privilege and power we have as men to create the space that doesn't replicate the old boys club, the old boys network. Make sure that the spaces that we're invited to, uh, often because of that privilege, don't look the same when we leave, right? Do what work we can to add a space of inclusion along the lines of gender and sexual difference uh, so that those who inherit that space after look different than us and, and that space is a bit more hospitable and open and inclusive when we leave it. And I'll leave it at that. Um, so, yes, thank you all three of you for your words and your introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, and it's also uh, very moving for me um, to have Carmel and Ann Kaji here, both of whom were my students. I'm the gray-haired woman on the stage. I'm, I have that, I'm the unique gray-haired woman on the stage. Um, um, so in, at the end of these very eloquent introductions, um, usually when I'm in the role of being the president of union, I'm the one who has to be alert and sort of watching what's going on and not um, actually paying attention to what I'm feeling in the moment. Um, but I need to be honest tonight that when I came back from my faculty meeting this afternoon and heard that the Senate had voted to call uh, the vote um, on Kavanaugh on Friday, I felt like I had been punched in the gut. And I honestly did not for a minute know if I could come and do this tonight. Um, and I thought to myself, um, what if I go there and I just start screaming? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, actually, I mean, it's, it would be not funny if I did it. <laughs> um, but, but that's, um, as myself, a survivor of sexual assault, as a professor who has devoted her life to scholarship um, related to gender-based violence and sexual assault and trauma, um, as the leader of a school in which um, we daily realize that um, the students who enter our doors um, are, uh, are drenched in the trauma of lifetimes of assault. And so to once again see this be playing out on a national stage um, that will culminate in um, uh, tomorrow's scene 
um, that some people will watch with fascination, others with utter horror, um, and that our nation is again um, on the verge of going through another uh, ritual of affirmation of the fundamental principle upon which this nation was founded and it goes deep into the heart of Christianity itself and that is the assumption that men have the right to sexual access to women's bodies. That sits there at the heart of it all. And until we can, I think, at a um, spiritual level begin to recognize how deep that is in our culture. Um, it's not something that you just wake up one day and say, oh, now I see it, make it go away. Um, it is um, something that runs through our, the marrow of our bones and it has been normalized over thousands and thousands of years. Um, so uh, to begin to create an environment in which that is not a given is takes mighty, mighty hard work. And the women who are coming forward are, uh, to use Christian language, are in my mind saints in this movement, that they're literally um, laying themselves um, bare um, to move us forward. Um, and in that regard, uh, I think that it's important um, to not only go back to Tawana Burke, but to remember even further back uh, to Ella Baker, um, who at the beginning of, we never tell this story about the civil rights movement, but the civil rights movement began as a movement um, of African American women led by Ella Baker against sexual violence against black women um, primarily by white men. And that was where the civil rights movement got its first, first organizing impulse. So this is a struggle that's been going on for a very long time. And we owe a lot to those who, on whose shoulders we stand. Um, but man, we gotta carry a lot of weight on our shoulders because um, it's a long road ahead. And um, I'm glad I did not um, start shouting. Um, <laughs> but, um, but and, and I say that, I, I actually don't, th don't say that as something funny. That's the feelings inside of me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there is a, a sort of, um, to, just to name it here, there is this like really profound rage that we are here the evening before um, this event tomorrow, the spectacle um, in which um, another woman's story will be laid out like with her body to be, move us forward and most likely um, rejected. So it's a very, in my mind, uh, it's a very terrible time and a very, um, as a minister, I can say, a sacred time for us to think profoundly about the grip of what we're caught in. Well, thanks to all of you for those comments, and I think that it is... Um, a real testament to each of our professionalism and magic that we are not all screaming right now. Um, and I think you really just gave, everybody just gave words to things that I've been feeling over the course of the last couple of weeks as the events of this country have been unfolding uh, and we have all watched in varying degrees of horror and amazement. Um, so, you know, I, I wanna just ask a few questions to the panel um, s starting with, um, Serene, some of the comments you just made about the history and the dynamics of harassment and abuse and what's really behind them. Um, you know, obviously, as you said, s sexual harassment and abuse have been a problem that have plagued society since, essentially, uh, it started. Um, and the, the term sexual harassment has really become part of our lexicon, you know, in the last half of the last century. Um, but but they, the behaviors it describes obviously predate that. And I'm, you know, 
there's a debate about who named the term first, sexual harassment. Um, some feel it was um, came out of consciousness raising groups in Massachusetts. Some um, give it a different origin, and then it was you know named and popularized by Catherine McKinnon in her uh, book Sexual Harassment of Women, Working Women. Um, so the term sexual harassment, in including the term sexual, um, characterizes it in a particular way. And how does the language that we've come to understand as describing this problem and this issue limit us in understanding what is at play behind sexual harassment? So I'll pose that to the to the group, but maybe yeah, you can start. Yeah, and so we, I mean, we do owe so much to Catherine McKinnon for, in a legal context, trying to name and move forward and point out very rightly that when they're is um, power inequities, um, you create a context in which people become vulnerable. Um, but I think what, um, and this is where I would disagree with McKinnon, is that what it misses is that it's not just sexual harassment, it's harassment by men of women who believe they have the right to sexually violate them. And that it is not, um, simply, a dis I don't mean to say that women never um, are incapable of sexually assaulting men. That's something we know can happen. But the grand drama that's played out through history is it's deeply gendered and it has to do with the violation, sexual violation of women. So if, if you make it simply into a discussion about power, you miss the specificity of the power relation which is um, men abusing women. So, you know, from the legal perspective, um, you know, and I think one of the reasons that New York City has, uh, has developed its law the way that it has, I mean, and I'll, I'll also note that in the, in the controversy of who named sexual harassment, there's also, um, there is also history that, that traces the term back to uh, one of my predecessors, Eleanor Holmes Norton, while she was chair of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, she actually held the first ever hearings on gender discrimination uh, that had ever been held uh, nationally. And so there is, there is commentary that it actually started uh, at those hearings. But so if I look at even just jurisprudence within New York City or our law, we tend to look at things as broadly gender-based harassment or, um, or gender-based discrimination, uh, with the idea being that in some ways there are limitations to how people think of sexual harassment. That for a lot of people, what that conjures up um, is, is very different from the, the experience of the person who is experiencing that type of harassment, that looking at, um, looking at that form of harassment or discrimination just in terms of something that is sexualized or sexual mm -hmm. does not sufficiently capture all the things that go into what happens when somebody is sexually harassed. The power imbalances, mm -hmm. the humiliation, the ways that, you know, I th Serena was just talking about how um, the violation that is experienced, where I, 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 would, I would wager that if we spoke to um, a lot of the, the folks who had been involved in sexual harassment related cases, um, whether you're talking to the lawyers involved or you're talking to folks who are accused of sexual harassment, you know, they are not going to think of themselves as being violators because there's been such a norm associated with sexual harassment, right? Um, in December of 2017, the commission uh, you know, following Eleanor Holmes Norton's lead, we put together our own citywide public hearing on sexual harassment, where we wanted to make sure that uh, the diversity of experiences of people who had been experiencing sexual harassment or sexual assault in the workplace was being held, was being heard. You know, at that point, a lot of the focus had been on celebrities or folks who were prominent in the media. Um, and as I'm going to venture to say, everybody here knows. You know, this, these are daily experiences felt in everyday workplaces. So we wanted to make sure we were capturing industries where um, 
that, were, that are considered non-traditional uh, workspaces for women, that we were capturing domestic workers' experiences, that we were certainly capturing the experiences of folks who are more vulnerable to sexual harassment just by their very existence, like LGBTQ individuals. You know, in my, um, in my background as a private uh, attorney, I represented a lot of trans and gender non-conforming individuals, and their very existence was was, was sexualized in a workplace. It was, it was uh, difficult for people to understand how you wouldn't be able to talk about sex or sexualize something just because they were transgender and they were existing. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanted to make sure that we were capturing this diversity of experience and as part of that, uh, of that uh, awareness of folks' rights of, of uh, you know, combating sexual harassment or gender-based discrimination uh, in New York City. We also ran a, a campaign in New York City that some of you may have seen in taxi cabs or, or, or uh, subway cars where, you know, it said, it's just a joke, and it would slash it out and say it's actually sexual harassment, or uh, it's just a hug. And I have to tell you how many trolls <laughs> we received with the response being, I can't hug people in the workplace. I can't tell somebody she looks nice. I can't do. And that, to me, is very clear of the dynamic and the, this uphill battle that we have ahead of us that we have to explain, that we still have to obviously very clearly explain why, yeah, you can't do that in the workplace. You want to hug someone? Go home and do that. Or the fact that, you know, the nuances of this, that it is, we're talking about unwelcome behavior, unwelcome mm -hmm. verbal behavior, or physical behavior, and, and understanding those cues. And if you're not so good at reading those cues, then just don't do it. But the reaction that we got back on that campaign from so many people validated it. Clearly, it made sense for us to do that because clearly there was still so much misunderstanding or I think in some cases, intentionally not wanting to understand what we were talking about. I'm gonna leave it there. So that was a great campaign in the taxi cabs. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you. <laughs> so perhaps an elephant in the room, um, the events of the past week have placed Yale at the center of the latest controversy in light of the allegations by uh, Ms. Ramirez. Um, these allegations have prompted calls by law school faculty for a full investigation along with sit-ins by Yale Law School students in the Senate and various letters circulating from um, Yale alums, both male and female, protesting what they view as the university's um, part or complicity in, in some view of in the nomination in silencing survivors. So what steps should Yale be taking as an institution, both with respect to the Kavanaugh nomination and also on an everyday basis to ensure that survivors on campus who speak out are heard and respected and, and their cases are taken seriously? So you're the, no, you're the only non-Yaley, you get to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to take questions from answers yeah. from the panelists first, and and then we'll turn to the crew. The well, I, the first thing I want to say is that, um, as it, in talking about Yale, we have to be very conscious of the fact that the reality of what's happening at Yale is th the reality of every single college campus and university in the United States, um, which is not to excuse it; it's just to set it in the context of the magnitude of the issue. Um, I, um, uh, um, I do believe that leadership um, in university and college and seminary settings does have a moral responsibility to speak out and to um, affirm um, any conditions that protect the safety of students and to do everything to promote that and um, and to uh, speak out in a broader context when the values that the university is trying to implement on the ground right then and there are not being upheld in a, in a, in a larger space. So I would, I would not um, be opposed to at all. I would encourage Yale to make a public statement. I'm going to try to respond without an expletive. But I think that 
the main thing that Yale can do to be helpful in this movement would be to stop producing men who go on to the highest forms of power, whose sole objective or at least guiding force seems to be to destroy women's lives. That would be helpful. <laughs> For a start, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, Yale is also producing the woman who spoke out. Yes. And that's something to acknowledge. I want to leave time for questions from the audience, so let's, at this point, open it up. Um, so I had heard one question from the front. We have, we have two mics. Yeah, we do have microphones, so the microphones are going to be handed around. And if you could also just identify yourself, if you feel comfortable doing that, so that people know who you are. It was right in the falling, middle, right? the second row. I've been around a long time, so this is not a new subject for me, but um, we are clearly in crisis mode today. I just saw uh, President Trump for 20 minutes go on global television after the UN meeting uh, t uh, denying the allegations of four or five or six, he couldn't remember, women that he sexually assaulted. For 20 minutes he spent on the global news talking about that. This is a serious crisis situation. Um, you know, I, we don't have time to intellectualize about this. We, don't, we need to activate, seriously. We can't let these white men in robes get away with this. This is um, a crisis. When I was um, in the 70s, I was the first woman CEO of a nationally recognized advertising agency. One of my largest accounts was Time Life. And uh, I remember standing at the board meetings um, dressed very appropriately, and they would talk to me about the shape of my breasts. So, you know, I had to be Teflon lady, as you were describing. It's not pleasant, but this goes on forever. But, you know, since the Pharaoh's times, they've been bullying women. But I think it was the, um, the Rat Pack who changed it into harassment, serious harassment, because they objectified women publicly. Before that, it was always behind back doors, bullying and, and, and you know, just power trips. But um, so anyway, everybody has to get out and vote. Everyone has to activate and do something, march. We cannot let these men get away with this. And why do women not talk about it? Because it's so deep in your shame center afterwards. And um, who wants to be known for the rest of their life as damaged goods? I mean, that's, you're going to have a label, damaged goods. So nobody wants to talk about it. And before, if anyone, it was, you know, now at least we have the vocabulary and we're talking about it. And we have to continue. No, I didn't have a question. <laughs> In the back. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Rebecca and uh, I'm Trumbull College, class of 78. I just wanted to talk about the other elephant in the room, which is white male privilege. I, I think we, we cannot discuss sexual harassment and the issues that are before us today with understanding the racial and ethnic component, uh, the mm -hmm. life experience of uh, Ms. Martinez coming to Yale and what she experienced. And I'd, I'd really like the panelists to reflect on white male privilege and how that plays into the situation that we are facing today. Well, I, I don't know if there was a question. Can I ask the question? Necessarily. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I, I, yes, yes. Yes, it, this um, um, sexual assault, sexual harassment um, it never happens to an abstract person. Um, whoever is harassing and whoever is harassed is always raced and um, s sexual identified and class anchored. And we know from experience um, that is a ho long standing horrific experience that if you are a woman of color, a non gender conforming um, woman, you are much more likely to be assaulted and to have no 
um, capacity um, in legal or social context to seek redress. And I've been reading, I've been very um, moved by the conversations about uh, Anita Hill and um, what it was like for her to go through this as a woman of color sitting in a room filled with white men who were interrogating her, questioning everything she did. And the interesting questions is, you know, um, what would have happened if Anita Hill had been um, Ford? Um, and what would have mm. happened to Clarence mm. Thomas yeah. if, if um, the racial um, dynamics had been different? So it's always um, happens in those contexts, and at the top of the pile is white male privilege. And this is not the first time, if it happens, that we will have had uh, um, a, a sexual offender on the Supreme Court. It's probably legion. Yeah. I have many reactions to that, which I know you're trying to take other questions, so I'm happy to, to react to that separately. I, I will say that, um, one, you know, what Serene was just saying about looking back at the Anita Hill he hearings, um, I, I'm going to say for a lot of people, I'm, it's, it stings, I think, women lawyers of color even more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just going to say yeah, it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, and there is very much, very much at the very top of our being is this idea that had this happened and had Anita Hill been white, it would have been a very different story, we think. For also, I'm sure, very complicated and probably not fantastic reasons, um, uh, also, uh, you know, implicating white privilege. Mm -hmm. And... Um, You'll have to forgive me. I'm also struggling to speak. I was talking to Serene earlier saying that this entire week, the rage level is so high. And I know this to be the case. There's a lot of people nodding, so I know you feel what I'm feeling. And I know that some of these folks do too. The rage level is so high to talk about it um, that it has been very challenging. But, you know, I, I will say that when I, um, when, when the first cases that I had at the commission when I came here in, um, and I started adjudicating cases in 2015 was involving uh, a case with, uh, with allegations of sexual harassment that had taken place over the course of three years. And uh, under our law, we have the ability also to levy civil penalties in order to, uh, to be basically a deterrent uh, for people engaging in sexual harassment or whatever type of discrimination in the future. And we are limited uh, in the amount of civil penalties we can levy. We can levy up to $250,000 for acts that are considered willful, wanton, and malicious. And in the history of the commission, that had never been levied. And we looked at the sexual harassment case, and it came before us, and um, again, it was uh, a, uh, what I think is a very egregious uh, uh, case of sexual harassment involving touching and groping and sexual creating a sexualized work environment over the course of three years and reaching, you know, um, like I said, groping and uh, and during the course of the actual trial, the uh, one of the respondents, the the, the bad actor, the sexual the, se the alleged sexual harasser, said that he felt that he had. Um, that he deserved to do it. So he, he, he basically just very explicitly talked about his entitlement to it. Mm. And so looking at the record as a whole, we levied a civil penalty of $250,000. And there were some folks that said, wow, this is the highest civil penalty you could, and this is the case that you're doing it? Like, why is this so terrible? She wasn't raped. Mm. So I take that I take that as the example, again, sadly, for this idea that some people really just don't get it. That somebody can explicitly state their entitlement to violate somebody's person and dignity, and still people didn't get it. So. Um, okay. Um, I, I, me too. So I've been around, I've been there in a big time. Now, a survivor, my mother survived, 12 of her siblings get killed. That, in Poland, was a survivor. 
So to use that word, mm -hmm. it's a little over the hill as far as I'm concerned, even though I've been there, like I said. In the 60s, we burned the bras and we were, you know, sexual is freedom, okay? That's not right, but now, if we take every case back to 30 and 40 years, it is totally abusing the fact that there is abusive and that we have to deal with that. But we can go to where in the 60s we said it's okay, and now you're gonna count everybody for doing something 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I think we have to start now and be strong and stand for it. What was the question? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having. If you want to restate maybe with a question, that would be helpful for the panelists. Is, what, how far are we going to take the Me Too? 30 years, 40 years, are we in uh, I mean, I think we're going overboard, and that's demeaning what we are really stand for. It demeans the fact that it is happening when we take it to where there was a freedom of sex in the 60s. So I'm, if I'm understanding your question, it's, is it related to how, can we judge behavior that took place in the 60s by the standards of today? Is that sort of what you're trying to get at? Okay, so maybe past behavior and how does that hold up when we look at it through the lens of changed awareness and changed circumstances? And, you know, of course, some of the behaviors in question in the Kavanaugh nomination took place in the 1980s. Um, so, you know, certainly there have been some tough reexaminations of some of those behaviors from the 1980s that have been taken place and reexaminations. So. One of the things that I notice as a pastor is that a lot of people spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out whether or not their trauma compares against someone else's and whether or not then there's validity in their experience. And so what I hear here from you is that you've had serious trauma in your life. And so as you look at other stories and hear other stories, it sort of says, well, this doesn't quite compare to what I've gone through and what I have survived, if that's even a word that you would want to use. So I just want to acknowledge that um, and whatever stories go along with that. But what we also find is that there really isn't a statute, statute of limitation on stories and experience and also on trauma, that it gets written into our bodies and our ability to be loved, to show compassion to other people, to thrive, to be able to walk with safety, to be able to exist um, fully. And this is actually work that Serene has done and has taught me about how to start to find grace through our trauma. So instead, for me, you know, if I were your pastor, which I'm not, we might explore how we can find compassion for whatever the experience someone is having. And within that, just to listen and to see where we'll go. But I, for one, would not say that we stop, you know, we start now and then we, from any point forward, we're, we're going to be against harassment. That doesn't quite make sense. It also doesn't teach people that it is safe to, to share their stories. And as we know, many people are saying, like me, are saying, well, we never, ever talked about this before. There are things I'm starting to talk about now that nobody, I didn't even talk to myself about, right? And many women, I see a lot of head shaking, people who have survived, which they are doing because they're alive, wonder what will come of this acknowledgement. And part of my job as a person who thinks morally, is that we have to make the experience of sharing and experiencing and coming to the truth of our traumatic experience, we have to make that not re-traumatizing for the people as they start to acknowledge it. So that would be my hope. 
you know, just being brief, I would, I would also say that, you know, while there is a statute of limitations for purposes of legal claims, right, and under our law for, for city human rights law claims, it's three years in this space, um, and there could be different statute of limitations for sexual assault under civil as well as criminal statutes, that Me Too, I'm just going to go back to Me Too since mm -hmm. that's like the title of the panel. Uh, the Me Too movement is a movement based in empathy. You know, and there is no timeline, there is no statute of limitations on hurt or empathy. And so when you are feeling it, when, are you, when you are able to, to talk about, experience it, acknowledge it, when you are able to show empathy for it, that is at heart what I think the Me Too movement is. I think that's what Tarana Burke would also say is, the heart, or Alyssa Milano for that matter. I think that is at heart what the movement is about. It is a movement of empathy. And so there is no statute of limitations on that. I would just add briefly, I think um, that thinking historically also invites us to look at issues above just the individual perspective. So in part, it's about allowing in individuals having a space to tell their story, but it's also about holding the institutions to account mm -hmm. that often silence those stories in those moments, mm -hmm. right? That we can't just get at through the present. Mm -hmm. That it's about over time, over change over time and institutions have sided with the folks who committed the acts and not with the victims. Can I add one more thing? You know, I, I often say this as a lawyer, there are things that people or institutions have to do because mm -hmm. it's the law and you have to do it. Then there's also just the right thing to do, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And in, in this space, I think that is also very much what we're talking about. We're not, we're not, people are not raising these issues because they're thinking, I want to take legal action against this person. Mm -hmm. They are raising these things so that institutions change, yeah. so that bodies are not reformed with other people who per perpetrate bad acts against other people. Mm -hmm. um, what is the right thing to do? That's not always what the law captures, yeah. but isn't that what we should be capturing? And I just, to add to that, I think that also on a, on a moral level, there is no time frame on when something becomes morally reprehensible. It wasn't as if, um, an, that slavery was okay until it was abolished. I mean, it was, it was a horrible uh, reality for 300 years, and, and it wasn't more horrible or less horrible. Um, and so if we start calculating um, human suffering that way, we're really going to tie ourselves in knots because that's not how it works. Okay, hi. We are running out of time, so okay. I think this is our last okay. question. Very quickly. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry, we had actually, we had somebody who was already speaking, so we'll, we'll keep our places in the queue. Go ahead. Okay, just quickly. Um, I feel that we are the, at the white hot center of what's happening right now. Could you just say your name? What, my name is Christina Baker Klein. I am class of 86. My husband, David Klein, is here. Um, uh, first of all, while we've been talking, number one, a fourth woman has come forward, according to ABC News, uh, NBC News. And number two, uh, Trump is wavering on his support for Kavanaugh. So it's very interesting what's happening. I, um, a week ago, um, I, so I'm a writer. I'm a novelist. And I have a lot of friends who are journalists and novelists. And a week ago, I got um, a, a, a confidential email saying that there are two women at Yale who are going to come forward against Kavanaugh. Um, what can we do? And for the past eight days, I have been working on this. I pulled in two friends, Kate Manning, and uh, who was class of 79, Rebecca Steinitz, class of 86, who's an amazing kick-ass activist. And I said, we, what are we gonna do? We have to do something. We created a letter from Yale women um, that um, we thought would get 200, perhaps, responses. We're up to 3,000 at this point. It's been covered by the New, York, New Yorker, the New York Times, um, a dozen other news outlets, um, and the men, and we've got a whole group of men who created a letter from men at Yale as well um, in support of the Yale women who are coming out. I don't know if the second woman is going to come out. She's wavering. But the first woman, uh, whom um, we support fully in her 
um, desire to share her story, ha as you know, has, has spoken out. And I just want to say thanks to all of you for doing this. This is so timely and so incredible. And so many of us, um, what, I, what I say is that um, I'm a novelist. I dwell in the gray areas. I'm really interested in both sides of every story. I'm a reluctant advocate and a reluctant ad um, activist, but um, I couldn't stay silent on this. And um, I'm so proud of my fellow Yale students who are speaking up and, um, and jumping in. My, hus my son, my, my husband and I graduated, our son graduated this year, and um, we feel that we're, in his world and in our world moving forward, everything is changing. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. I think that's unfortunately all the time we have. So I know that this is such an incredible. Um, I, I'm hearing protest from the crowd. So, so I have been granted a reprieve of five more minutes. Thank you, Dean Sterling. Um, so. Okay, yes, and I, I'm going to take two more. I'm going to take two more. I'll take can you hear, one can and then you hear me? in the back. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take very much time as I'm sitting back here. I graduated from YDS in 61. A lot of my time has been spent with men's groups, working with men's groups. I started men's groups. I lead a men's group of all kinds and varieties of men. And I think it's got to start with a transformation in men's thinking. They have to be, they have to understand what's going on and the effects on women in, in very detailed discussion in sensitive ways. Because the men that I know, and I know many men of all ages, they would be open to this. Men don't, do not want to hurt women. And I think as long as we perpetuate perpetuate the paradigm of a war and violence and not get at the heart. Men don't want to be violent. There are many sick men. But I've worked with so many men who go through so much pain themselves that they've never been able to express their own intimate feelings and hurts and some abuse. And I've had enough experience to know men can change if they really understand the depth, and I think this whole movement has been, it's been very important, but the work has to start with men, and men's change. Hi everyone, thank you so much for this panel. I found to be really enlightening. I, I wish more young people were here for this conversation. I just graduated from Yale a year ago. I'm here with my college roomie and our group chats have been filled with so much discussion around the Kavanaugh hearings. We were six years old when Anita Hill happened, so this is our first time really experiencing a huge national moment, uh, movement like this. Um, and so my question is, I feel like I go to a lot of these talks and I'm filled with helplessness. How can, can you guys offer up any words of optimism, actionable next steps that I as a young person who has an entry level job, really an entry level position in life, um, how, can, how can we, you know, I know progress is gradual, but how can we impact change tomorrow? I really want to turn that rage into action. And outside of voting, I feel a little bit helpless um, in this overwhelming city. So, yeah. thank you. Such a, a great, great question. question to end. It's a great place on. to end as well. I think, I think the patriarchy is standing on the ramparts and is really trying in its last bastion to hold on to the power. And I think whatever chunk of dismantling that patriarchy you might be able to have an effect on. And that may very well have to do with where you are in your life and what you can see around you, but there is something there. Part of it 
you know, might just, I didn't study any fem feminist literature in undergrad, for example. And so deepening in my understanding of what that was, was a first step. Um, being able to connect to some of the organizations, even in small donations, a $5 a month donation to NYCLU is, is helpful or to some other organizations that are supporting um, women and, and liberty and freedoms. Um, or my church, for that matter. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think that there are a number of ways to connect. Of course, um, fly to Georgia. Stacey Abrams down there m might be the next uh, governor, which I fly or drive down to Pennsylvania, um, turn out voters after you vote here in Philadelphia. In, um, I, I go to black neighborhoods because that's a place where I, I work well. Um, and just finding what one thing you can do and just starting there and then it'll be fascinating to see what else will come from that. You know, I'll also add that the fact that this, the fact that we're at the Yale Club <laughs> And we're talking about Yale alums. I mean, mm -hmm. being from Yale, and you may not feel it right now, <laughs> but being from Yale, you are a power broker. Um, I remember when I first graduated, or I remember when I graduated law school, the first time I was in a courtroom, the judge looked up and said, great, the translator's here. Oh, wow. But then there are other spaces you go to, and they see that, OK, you're, you're not just this brown girl in the room, a random brown girl, but you graduated from Yale. And that means something to a lot of people. So you may not feel it now, but I will tell you from experience that it also makes you a power broker. So whether you decide to hone your skills with community organizing or the law or medicine or speaking to congregations or in acad academics, you want to get those skills up. Because in all of those aspects, in every single aspect, we need people who are there and thinking about the people who don't have that Yale degree on their resume, who did not have the ability to go to school, who did not have the ability to go to such a prestigious, who, who don't have those doors opened. Um, and I didn't feel it when I graduated from college. And I look back and I think about how much, because of going to Yale, the people I met there, uh, the folks who I interacted with, the privilege I had of knowing how to interact with those people, how that has been able to carry me into you know, my current role, my current position. Um, I'm not a doctor like my mom wishes I was, <laughs> but, you know, but I'm able to influence other very important decisions in the lives of a lot of the people that we're talking about. And so I would, I would think about like where your interests are and you're gonna probably play around with that a little bit. Combination of what your interests are and what your skills are and hone them because you know, if, you, if, if people, if you're somebody who is, um, who is, who feels comfortable with the idea of the resistance, the resistance needs skills in all different areas because there's a lot of organization on the other side. I'll also just add that you know there are many organizations out there, and this goes for people who are not just entry level in life, but maybe at a different level in life. There are organizations out there that you can plug into and follow. Um, you can join you know email lists to get alerts about actions that you can take on a daily basis to plug in and make a difference on this issue and a host Sign of other issues. Sign up for the issues. commission's uh, newsletter. Sign the up for website. the commission's newsletter. Sign up for the ACLU's mailing list. And there is a, a People Power is our new activist arm of our organization that is trying to mobilize the resistance and change. Um, you know, sign up to be an ACLU voter, um, and you can find out the record of your elected representatives and all the people who are running for office on civil liberties issues. So there are a number of ways to get engaged that I encourage everybody in all uh, stages of their lives to, to be taking right now and you know to get active like never before because uh, now is the time. <laughs>